Step nine is to minimize harmful chemical residues in foods. So what do we want to minimize? Agrochemicals, the pesticides, herbicides, the plant growth regulators, veterinary drugs like hormones and antibiotics and antimicrobial agents, which are often used on imported fish, for example, like melachite green, environmental contaminants, the heavy metals and the persistent organic pollutants, the packaging materials like BPA, the, the um, products of food uh, processing and cooking like the heterocyclic amines and the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and acrylamide and advanced glycation end products and the aldehydes like acrolein formed from cooking fat, food additives and preserv like preservatives and colors and flavors and artificial sweeteners and all of that garbage. What do they do to us? Well, the damage done by these chemicals is unbelievable. It caught, number one, oxidative stress, but they fuel inflammation, they disrupt hormones, they act as obesogens, they, they damage, they're, they're neurotoxic, they damage the brain, the nervous system, they, they damage the liver, kidneys, reproductive systems, every body system is damaged by these compounds. They increase our risk of every chronic disease that we know of. So first of all, agrochemicals. How do we deal with them? By choosing organic when we can. By growing organic in our own gardens. You know, um, I, I like this, the Environmental Working Group, it puts out their Dirty Dozen Clean 15 list every year. And so for people that can't necessar necessarily afford everything organic, it lists the foods that are sort of the least concentrated in pesticides and those that are the most concentrated, the Dirty Dozen, and people can avoid those specifically. We want to use foods without excessive packaging, use jars instead of cans, or use BPA-free packing materials. Uh, where environmental contaminants are concerned, these chemicals move up the food chain and they are, you know, very concentrated in animal products like fish, meat, and dairy products. So we need to eat lower on the food chain to reduce our intake of these compounds. For people that eat fish, they need to be very aware of the pollutants in fish, the dioxins and the heavy metals, and there are a lot of assistance for them. There are, there are a lot of uh, these kinds of, of forms online that explain where these products are, are really uh, uh, located. So what about products of high temperature cooking, like heterocyclic amines? These are carcinogens. They were listed as carcinogens and in, in the NIH uh, uh, or listed them as carcinogens in 2005. Uh, they are formed uh, in meat, poultry, fish, and eggs when they're cooked at high temperature. They are not formed in plants because you need either creatine or creatinine to form uh, heterocyclic amines, and plants don't contain creatine or creatinine. So people who are vegetarian don't get any heterocyclic amines. What about polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons? These compounds are known mutagens. They're linked to lung, skin, and genital urinary cancers. They are formed when foods are blackened. The blacker the food, and it doesn't matter if it's a plant food or not, all foods form PAHs. Anything heated above 392 degrees Fahrenheit can form PAHs. So grilled or charred meat, poultry, fish, but they're also formed in grains or anything else that we fry in oil, like French fries. Advanced glycation end products, these are, um, these Im literally impair immune function, they accelerate aging, they contribute to the progression of all of the chronic degenerative diseases and damage to our organs. And advanced glycation end products, the most concentrated sources are cooked processed meats. So this is a broiled frankfurter at the top of the list, then boiled frankfurters, so processed meat, and then grilled or fried meat. But even fried tofu will contain these advanced glycation end products. Snack foods like chips and cookies and so forth also contain them, and fruits and veggies are very low in these compounds. So finally, acrylamide. And acrylamide is something that is formed 
When high carbohydrate foods are heated above about 248 degrees Fahrenheit, which isn't a very high temperature, so they form very easily, even if you're baking potatoes or especially with dry heat, and the really highest amounts of acrylamide are in potatoes because potatoes are high in an amino acid called asparagine, and that's what you need to produce acrylamide is this higher levels of asparagine. So you can see the, the potatoes and then rye crisp breads and anything that's cooked for a long time at a fairly high heat you will produce acrylamide in. <clears throat> we want to use food preparation methods that minimize the production of these harmful uh, compounds. So wet cooking methods as opposed to dry cooking methods or frying. And finally, minimize food additives, minimize processed foods to avoid all of the harmful chemicals that are used in these foods. And finally, step 10, maintain a healthy body weight. We want to minimize liquid calories. Do not drink your calories. They don't register with your appetite control center. Drink water instead, or drink green juices. But no sugar-sweetened beverages. Limit foods with any added fat, sugar, and salt or eliminate these foods completely. You know, there's, I like this book, Salt, Sugar, and Fat. It explains how these foods are so addictive. You know, the human body is wired to like these flavors for our survival. And so when we take them out of foods and concentrate them, we can't stop eating. It's just the way we're wired. And so we have to avoid eating them. Avoid deep fried foods. This is shocking. You take one potato with about 160 calories and turn it into french fries, 521 calories, and you've added 360 calories of pure fat. Yeah, for one potato. It's shocking. Avoid the stuff. Portion control is so important. And if you look at what we've done in, in, to portion sizes, this came from the CDC in the 1950s. You know, a, a soda was 7 ounces, now it's 42 ounces. A hamburger was 3.9 ounces, now it's 12. French fries were 2.4, now they're 6.7. And of course, as you increase serving sizes, you increase the sizes of people. Right? Supersize food, you supersize people. So don't supersize your food except for salad. You're allowed to supersize salad. <laughs> and you need to rewire your taste buds completely. And they can be completely rewired. It takes probably 20, 30 days at the most to get your taste buds accustomed to real food and to enjoy it. You know, Dr. Furman talked yesterday about how people aren't addicted to things like kale or broccoli. And I almost said, I don't know about that. Because when I go away and I don't have access to my greens, I feel like I'm going into withdrawal. I really do. I, so I, I think we can, we can change all of that so well. And finally, eat mindfully and gratefully. Be really conscious about where the food is coming from and be grateful for the food that you have. And finally, one last um, point is to be truly optimal. The diet has got to be ecologically sustainable and ethically justifiable. You know, there is no one step that any human being can take that would do more for the preservation of this planet than going vegan. That's my, my firm belief. <clears throat> Some people suggest going back to our roots and eating a paleo diet to help protect the planet. During the Paleolithic period, the human population rose from a half a million people to about six million people. Today, there are 7.5 billion people on this planet. If we were all hunter-gatherers, we would need 15 planet Earths to sustain the current population. 
Our population growth is not slowing down. By 2050, it is estimated that we will have 9.3 billion people on this planet. The ultimate question has got to be, how can we as human beings best adapt to our current environment to sustain ourselves and all life on this planet? Because we are on a traje trajectory that is not very appealing. The United Nations Environmental Program expert panel concluded that two activities have a disproportionately large effect on this planet's life support system. Number one was animal agriculture, especially livestock and dairy, and number two was the use of fossil fuels. And their recommendation, a global shift to a plant-based diet. I believe they might have even used the word vegan. The FAO of the United Nations in 2013 said the livestock sec sector is responsible for 14.5% of all human-caused GHG admissions. Cattle, 65% of this. This is more than all forms of transportation combined. It's shocking. The award-winning environmental study of 2008 by Weber and Matthews from Carnegie Mellon University found that eating a 100% plant-based or vegan diet just one day a week reduces greenhouse gas emissions more than eating local seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So for people that are on the local bandwagon, we need to eat lo local, but it's even more important that we eat plant-based. And finally, we need, our diet, in my view, needs to be ethically justifiable. Animal life, we, most of us, like to imagine animals on farms this way. A hundred years ago, 40% of the population lived on farms. Today, it's 1.9%, and we've got a lot more people. How are we feeding those people? Well, we need a reality check, because we are slaughtering on this planet Earth 70 billion animals a year. There are 7.5 billion people on this planet, and we kill 70 billion sentient animals every year for food. 90 to 95 percent of these animals are being raised in concentrating, concentrated animal feeding operations, otherwise known as factory farms. And we have a choice. It makes very little sense to funnel wholesome plant foods through animals in an overpopulated world. When we consider our food choices, not just for ourselves, but beyond ourselves, a plant-based diet simply makes sense. Becoming vegan, what it's all about is it is about widening our circles of compassion. It is about refusing to contribute to the pain, suffering, and death of 70 billion animals a year, not including the animals from the sea, when it is absolutely unnecessary. Not only is it unnecessary, it's destroying us and it's destroying the planet. It is absolutely insane what we are doing. It makes zero sense. <clears throat> and I believe that the fate of this planet rests in human hands. Our food choices matter. They matter not just for us, not just for our neighbors, not just for the animals. They matter for all life on this planet. And I want to leave you with um, a quote by Dr. Albert Schweitzer, who I think we all uh, know and admire. The time is coming when people will be amazed that the human race existed so long before it recognized that thoughtless injury to life is incompatible with real ethics. Ethics in its unqualified form 
is extended responsibility to everything that has life. Thank you, Dr. Schweitzer. And uh, I will close with that. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And again, everything I covered is in the books, which I would be very happy to sign for you. Thank you.